This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk about how someone just paid $1.3 million for a picture of a rock. This is the story here. The rocks are what are called ether rocks, and they were one of the first NFTs, non-fungible tokens, ever invented. They were launched in 2017, and as the website here, the ether rock website says, these virtual rocks serve no purpose beyond being able to be bought and sold and giving you a strong sense of pride in being an owner of one of the only 100 rocks in the game. So there are only 100 rocks that were made, and these have been trading over the past few years, especially in the last week or so, at higher and higher prices. Uh, Justin Sun of Tron fame, the guy who basically just uh, made a copy, copy-pasted Ethereum, made a lot of money in the process. He just spent $500,000 on one of these rocks that has uh, has the Bitcoin laser eyes, I, ironically. And we can see how these can begin to function as status symbols. He's now using that uh, as his, uh, his Twitter picture right here. When I, see, uh, when I see NFTs and I see them being used in this way, I'm reminded of the male peacock. And there's sort of an evolutionary psychological explanation for a lot of this behavior. What the peacock is saying, with this amazing and really beautiful display. He's saying, hey, Mrs. Peacock, I'm so good at finding food that my body can afford to grow these ridiculous feathers in the middle of the winter when food is scarce. So there is an interesting signaling mechanism at work here. It's a signal of fitness. It's a signal of mating fitness. And I think what Justin Sun is doing is something fairly similar. Hey, ladies, I'm so rich that I can blow $500,000 on a JPEG of a rock. So that's the, uh, that's the evolutionary psychology uh, explanation. If you're finding this video helpful so far, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button, and maybe share this video with a few friends who are interested in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and NFTs. There, there are other forms of status signaling, and some of them are, uh, you could debate whether they're worse or better than uh, having an NFT of a rock that you paid a half a million dollars for or 1.3 million dollars for. We have the uh, this Dutch hamburger, the world's most expensive hamburger that costs about $6,000. It's made, of course, from Wagyu beef, uh, Alaskan king crab, white truffles, beluga caviar, etc. Obviously, the raw materials that go into this uh, are very expensive. That being said, this is really being priced high in order to uh, to function as a luxury good. And this is this is an interesting luxury good because you only get to eat it once and enjoy it once and then it's gone. It's gone much faster than even an NFT. We see things like this all around in the fashion world. We see a Hermes bag here that's made of crocodile skin. Doesn't seem to have a lot of precious stones on it, just a little palladium selling for $165,000. This is a used purse for $165 thousand dollars. There's an economist named Thorsten Veblen who talked about this in, at, really at the turn of the century in his book that was called uh, The Theory of the Leisure Class. And he coined the term conspicuous consumption. He also coined the term uh, Veblen good. So what's conspicuous consumption? It's basically buying a very expensive luxury good in order to signal one's economic power and perhaps indirectly one's uh, value as a potential mate. So there's there's the direct route, which would be very gauche and would be very implied, I imagine, in in all human cultures, which would be basically you go on a date and you show your date a snapshot of the balance in your bank account. Maybe some very uh, gauche uh, billionaires might do this, but the, the, the preferred route in human culture and in human society is the indirect route. You signal economic wealth and economic fitness and mating fitness through clothes, jewelry, handbags, cars, uh, the classic middle-aged crisis car, for example, the classic convertible, or now uh, we're seeing this happening in the digital realm with NFTs. Now, the interesting thing about Veblen goods, which is what Thorsten Veblen coined, is that the demand for the good, the demand for a Veblen good actually goes up the higher the price. So normally, as the price of something goes up, 
people substitute away from it. If the, if the price of apples goes way up, maybe people start buying oranges instead. There's a substitution that takes place when the price of things go get high. Demand normally falls. But Veblen goods are very different in that the higher the price, the more demand for the good. And sometimes this is the strategy that sellers of luxury items uh, pursue. If this purse were available for $100, it would not be able to serve as a status signal. And so you have these really high margin, high markup uh, products instead. Now, many people have hypothesized that Bitcoin may also be a Veblen good in the sense that the higher the price goes, the more demand that there seems to be for it. When it was priced at a dollar or ten dollars or a hundred dollars, there wasn't a lot of demand. Now that the price has gone up so much, closer to fifty thousand dollars, there's a lot more demand for it. Owning Bitcoin uh, may already function as a bit of a status sig symbol or signal of wealth or a signal of sophistication or intelligence, but there's also a there's kind of a hidden feature of Bitcoin being a Veblen good, in that Bitcoin literally becomes more valuable as its price goes up. The higher the price of Bitcoin, the higher the hash rate of the Bitcoin network has to be, and hence the system becomes more secure. So Bitcoin may be functioning as a luxury good, but also as a more secure for form of money, the higher the price of Bitcoin goes. Now, if you want to buy NFTs, you're welcome to go for it, obviously. Um, these, are, these are free markets, but you should be either very good and have a good understanding of art or just be very lucky. It's very, very difficult, obviously, to pick the winners in the world of art. We have Marcel Duchamp's famous uh, famous uh, ready-made sculpture that's called Fountain, and all it is is a men's urinal, and he scrawled uh, with a crayon or pen or something, he scrawled our mutt on it and then dated it 1917. This is really one of the most uh, famous works of art from the 20th century, which may tell you something about the quality of art in the 20th century. We also have Jackson Pollock's, obviously. If you had showed this to me when Pollock was, was painting it and told me that it would be an extremely valuable painting someday, I would have missed out. Of course, I'm not an artist and I'm not an art critic or art collector as well. But if you're gonna collect M NFTs as uh, someone might collect Picassos or Da Vinci's uh, or Raffaello's, you need to be very uh, careful because it's gonna be very it's gonna be very difficult. Of course, if a piece of art, if an NFT gives you joy and you can afford it, go for it. If you want to buy an NFT or a piece of art to status signal, you can also obviously obviously go for it. But I would say the difference between the sort of artificial scarcity of ether rocks, where there's just a hundred rocks and there's this signaling game that's going on with people like Justin Sun, if instead you're interested in things like changing the world's financial system, helping the world to move to a decentralized, truly neutral reserve asset, helping to neuter the power of the world's central banks, and also helping to give power to people who don't have bank accounts, the world's unbanked, and helping them to fight their governments who cause hyperinflation, whether it's Venezuela or Zimbabwe, <clears throat> or even just the Federal Reserve who's been debasing our money quite rapidly over the last 18 months. If you're interested in these sort of things, uh, less the status signal, less the, the, the idea of buying art, then you should be buying Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin has the, uh, the obvious advantage as well. It's like, uh, I consider it like shooting, like shooting fish in a barrel. Bitcoin is also going to go up quite a bit. It's very unclear whether these ether rocks, whether this is truly greater fool theory with these ether rocks, but Bitcoin is uh, Bitcoin has value as a store of value, as a way of sending digital gold very quickly anywhere in the world in a permissionless, non-censorable fashion. Bitcoin is also has the advantage, besides uh, doing all these virtuous things, like helping to hurt and get rid of central banks, Bitcoin is going to go up a lot. And it's going to make people who understand it and are able to hold on to it a lot of money. Bitcoin's going to go to a million dollars. In the next couple of years, it's going to go to two million. It's going to go to 10 million. It's going to keep going up over time. As I said, Bitcoin is like shooting fish in a barrel. Unlike NFTs, it's much easier to pick as a long-term winner. Bitcoin has the highest hash rate, the highest security of any cryptocurrency, has that first mover advantage, most widely recognized cryptocurrency brand, and it's the first digital store of value that's been widely recognized as such by the markets, by Wall Street, by billionaires, and by retail traders like you and me. 
The thing about true digital scarcity is it can only be invented once, just like Picasso can only paint in his style once. Anyone who tries to paint like Picasso now, the, the paintings just aren't going to be as, as valuable. It's, things are very, very valuable when they happen the first time. And the same thing goes for digital scarcity. True digital scarcity can only be invented once, and it was invented by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008, 2009. Altcoins try to artificially recreate Bitcoin scarcity. And this, of course, has always been a good marketing game. This is what Ether Rocks and CryptoKitties do as well. But the, uh, this is quite artificial because these altcoins tend to be very centralized. They're controlled by a, a central party that, has, uh, that wields the bully pulpit like Charles Hoskinson or Vitalik Buterin. Also, it's very clear that these altcoins and rock NFTs certainly, which are built on Ethereum, will not be the world's new reserve asset. So they're not really in the same category as Bitcoin, just as other cryptocurrencies are in a completely different category from Bitcoin. They're more like unregistered securities that are being used to finance um, finance research or finance the luxurious right lifestyles of people like Justin Sun. Ethereum is not going to be the, the world's new reserve asset either. Nothing built on Ethereum, and Ethereum itself will not be, simply because of the really shady 70% pre-mine, which we've talked about before, the highly centralized leadership, uh, and also its move to proof of stake, which is really moving to a foundation of sand. And it, the move to proof of stake is a way to further enrich the original beneficiaries of the pre-mine and pre-sale, because they'll have uh, extra power under proof of stake. So Ethereum, unlike Bitcoin, Ethereum is not neutral money. Just recreating the fiat system with Vitalik on the top, at the top, instead of Jerome Powell. So if you're interested in changing the world, if you want the world's first truly scarce asset and truly decentralized asset, there's really only one asset. And uh, Bitcoin is really in an asset class of its own. There's only Bitcoin and Bitcoin is the next Bitcoin. Not NFTs, not Ethereum, not Cardano, not Ripple, just Bitcoin. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.